Thanks, Jeff. I have nothing to disclose financially, so let me get that out of the way and dive right into what we're going to talk about today, which is quality control for multiplex assays. So in lab medicine, we've gotten very good at doing single analyte assays. And I think that for many of us, the future really lies in combining multiple assays into a single diagnostic. Now, this happens all the time right now in the mind of the clinician. We talk about uh, a clinician seeing a stream of information that comes from us. They integrate it with a large neural network that they happen to carry around in their head and they make a diagnosis as a result of that. Multiplex assays potentially allow us to do some of that uh, in the clinical laboratory setting, and they also have other advantages. And of course, it's technology that's really driven this interest in multiplexing. It's DNA microarrays, it's high throughput sequencing, whether used for transcriptional profiling or for actual sequence, uh, primary DNA sequence. It's proteomics, it's metabolomics, it's all the other omics you can think of that have increased the kinds of data that we can acquire and the way in which we do this in parallel. And so we would argue, um, I think most of us, that this will be the enabler that will allow us to uh, um, have precision medicine. Precision medicine now being, I'm told, the preferred term instead of personalized medicine, the, the latest and greatest way of saying that we want to tailor ta um, therapy to a particular patient's biology. And the, if you want the central dogma of the highly multiplexed molecular fingerprinting kinds of assays is that if you have detailed enough profiling information, you, can, uh, you will have enough richness of data that you'll be able to capture all relevant biological states. So this is the idea that if you measure enough things, you'll find something in there that is pathognomonic, um, either alone or in combination for any, any biological or disease state that you might be particularly interested in. Of course, there are other reasons why we might be interested in this in the clinical lab. There are issues of cost containment, because it's now becoming less and less expensive to measure more and more things. So of course, to the extent that we can do that and batch those kinds of assays, that may be something that is of interest. And if you're particularly in a translational research setting, uh, sample uh, limitations may be, uh, of it, uh, may be of concern. This is obviously also an issue in pediatric clinical chemistry. Um, it may be that we want to maximize the number of analytes that we can measure from a very small sample. So for all of these reasons, we're interested in multiplex assays. And again, I'm thinking largely of omics style assays. So what's the problem with this? Why has this not yet hit the clinical lab? Well, there are a number of reasons for that, but I would argue that there are several fundamental problems and that, in fact, there is a, a pending culture clash between research omics work and the clinical laboratory. Large numbers of analytes, as I'll try to show you, raise fundamental barriers to traditional quality control measures. So I'll describe what those are and I'll describe why there are barriers. But once we start to measure a lot of things in a single assay format, we, we uh, create problems that we have not uh, solved to date. Specifically, there are no multiplex uh, Westgard rules, and I'll talk about singleplex Westgard rules in a moment, um, but there are no rules that we can use that have been codified that allow us to look at multiplex assays. But there is hope at the end of this talk, because I'm going to argue through the, uh, the course of the next hour that even in the worst case scenario, there are ways to overcome these problems, but the answer depends on the nature of your assay. So I'll describe over the course of the talk four different strategies we can take to overcome this problem with quality control and multiplexing depending on the nature of the assay. So what is it that we do when we are in the clinical lab and look at quality control? Well, typically, we start a run um, and do quality control at the end, beginning of a shift or the beginning of a batch, something like that. We run some set of samples. And then after that, we run patient samples. And then we can either at the end of the patient sample run or, in fact, at the end of the QC run, ask the question, do these quality control samples pass QC? And by pass QC, we typically mean something like this. We mean that during assay validation, we measured a particular control a number of times. We've developed not only a mean, but a precision for it. And we can say if this um, analyte, if the control is within two standard deviations of the mean that we established during assay validation, we're fine. Or three standard deviations, or however many standard deviations you think is appropriate for quality control. If the answer to that is, yes, it's within control, then we report out the patient samples and say things are going well. On the other hand, if, in, if we get a negative answer, then we recalibrate, troubleshoot, do some sort of intervention. It's telling us that we need to do something to make sure that this, pa this set of patient samples um, is appropriately measured. And we can look at those kinds of uh, results in the following way. We're interested in picking up problems both with um, accuracy, shifts in accuracy, as well as shifts in precision. So here we have a shift in accuracy. We have a shift to two standard deviations in this mean. Here we have a degradation in the red uh, checked uh, area, um, that, uh, degradation of precision. 
And we can actually codify um, how, how a particular rule uh, works, how well it works, um, in, with the graph that I'm showing you here in the uh, upper left. So we have a probability of rejection here on the y-axis and a number of standard deviations, accuracy uh, shift on the x-axis. So as we look here, we can say, for example, that if the, if the um, this, and this happens to be a 3S rule, so it is asking the question, is the control three standard deviations away from the mean? We can say if, this, the, if the actual shift of this assay was three standard deviations, we'd have about a 50% chance of rejecting the run and saying that the quality control was out. Right? So that gives us a sense for how powerful a particular rule is and how good it is at rejecting something. There is uh, another important part of this graph, which is the lower left-hand uh, side of uh, where everything hits zero, when the x-axis hits zero. Because that's really what um, you see if there's no problem. So if there's absolutely no problem, there is still a non-zero probability that you will reject the run, that just by chance you'll have something that's three standard deviations away, and you'll reject the run even though there's no fundamental problem with your uh, assay. So we want to pay close attention to that, that false rejection rate, and uh, see how that's affected as we move forward into multiplexing. This kind of approach is extended with the so-called Westgard multi-rules, which are criteria for rejecting a run based on control samples. So these were designed to capture variations in both accuracy and precision, as I showed you on the last slide. We have actual shifts in the, in the, uh, the bell curve, and then we have a widening of the bell curve, a loss of precision. And these rules were really designed for people who were st uh, staring at a Levy-Jennings plot. A Levy-Jennings plot is a plot of those control values on a daily basis or however often you do them with the mean and the standard deviations marked in such a way that you can easily tell when something has gone two standard deviations or three standard deviations away from that mean. So the Westgard multi-rules, uh, the first rule was if your three standard deviations, this is the so-called 1-3-S rule, if your three standard deviations from the target mean, then that's it, you're done, you failed quality control, you need to move on to the next thing. You, the next Westgard multi rule is if the last two values were greater than two standard deviations from the target mean, then something's wrong and you need to uh, de deal with it. The next rule you can see deals not so much with accuracy but with precision because the next rule says that if there's a difference between consecutive values of greater than four standard deviations, there's a problem. That would again reflect that curve starting to uh, widen and flatten out and you're starting to see your control bounce around even if you don't have an actual accuracy problem. And finally, the last rule you see on there is that if the last 10 values are on the same side of the mean, you would in fact reject. And what that tells you is that you have a shift in accuracy, and that's not large enough to see in any single individual run, but in fact, over time, you see that um, it's unlikely, if there had not been a shift in accuracy, that you would have had 10 control values on the same side of the mean. So those are the Westgard rules as we typically use them in a single plex. And again, let me uh, show you the 1-3-S rule just by itself. And you see again this curve that says if we shift, let's say, three standard deviations here in accuracy, we will get roughly a 50% chance that we will correctly um, reject that run. Similarly, from a precision perspective, if we shift three standard deviations in terms of multiplying uh, the standard deviations, uh, then in fact we have somewhere between a 20 and 30 percent chance of rejecting that run. And you can imagine shifting the curve to the right or to the left to either um, reject more or reject less depending on the stringency that you need. And once again, we have this false rejection rate that's the lower left-hand corner. So what happens when we multiplex? If we multiplex a 3S rule, we get the following. Now imagine that instead of uh, looking at a single analyte, we're looking at 100 analytes. These are 100 analytes being measured by multiplex mass spectrometry, or 100 analytes being measured in uh, some sort of RNA-seq experiment, or uh, some, some sort of other highly parallel DNA microarray or other kind of format. We now have 100 analytes, and we're trying to ask the same question. This could be Luminex. You can, you can fill in your own, famous, uh, your own favorite uh, uh, famous omics uh, uh, test in this uh, regard. What we see here is two things. First of all, we have um, a greater probability of rejecting a run if, in fact, we have a shift of three standard deviations. So actually, we do a little bit better at picking up a genuine three standard deviation uh, shift. However, we pay the penalty down here in this false rejection area. And this is essentially a result of the fact that we're doing multiple hypothesis testing. Rather than looking at a single analyte and saying, did that single analyte shift by three standard deviations, we're now doing 100 independent tests and asking if any of those analytes shifted by three standard deviations. And of course, if you do enough tests, just by chance, you will in fact fail quality control. And what you see here is that if nothing is wrong at that zero point, you still have between a 20 and 30 percent chance of falsely, in this case, rejecting the run. So clearly this is unacceptable. 
And in fact, the problem is worse as you start to look at more analytes. This is the, how difficult it is to pass, to pass the uh, three uh, sigma uh, quality control test in a uniplex assay. Your probability of passing, if all is well, is 0.997, very low uh, possibility of false rejection. With 10 analytes, it goes down to roughly 97%. With 100 analytes, it goes to 76%, and so on, down to a hypothetical whole proteome ship we could imagine. Let's imagine we could measure 30,000 analytes at once. And here now, the probability of passing QC has gotten infinitesimally small, 6 times 10 to the minus 36, which is a really, really small number when you think about it in comparison to the number of seconds in the history of the universe, estimated at 4.3 times 10 to the 17. That means that if we were to do um, on the order of, let's say, uh, what, 10 to the 19 or so um, quality control measures per second, we would not be in control at any point in the known history of the universe. And, and I, I don't need to tell you what hospital administration will think about turnaround time under those circumstances. <laughs> so how do we solve this? We have another problem that this creates. And the, problem, the fundamental problem when you think about it here um, is the fact that we're thinking about multiplex uh, testing in terms of a batch mode. Inherently, there is a batch mode that's in, that's in place. So that means that the assays succeeds or fails, and you can't rerun individual components as you would in, in, in another kind of lab test. So we have a different a, a set of choices that we have to uh, make. I'm now showing you in the lower left a hypothetical multiple reaction monitoring mass spectrometry assay, or you know again, insert your favorite uh, technology. And we have a low QC and a high QC, and the question is, do we report the analyte? So imagine that we run a bunch of uh, quality control specimens, and we have a failure of the second component in the low QC and a failure of the fourth component in the high QC. What do we do? Everything else passes. Do we report all the data and just say, well, you know, it's unlikely that there was really a problem here? Probably that's not going to be acceptable to too many people because there could, in fact, be a problem that you would then miss. You could accept some of the data. Um, you could say, well, we're only going to report those values that have passed QC. But then the problem is that in order to get the values that you missed, you have to rerun the whole assay anyway. So you end up iteratively rerunning the whole assay. It's a batch mode. You can't simply rerun individual components. So that's probably not acceptable. And accepting none of the data essentially amounts to the same thing. You have to th then rerun the whole assay. And uh, you can imagine this going on um, essentially infinitely if uh, you have enough analytes. So how do we get past this? Is this an insoluble problem? There are four strategies that I think are, can be used to successfully overcome this quality control problem for multiplexing, depending on the nature, nature of the assay. The first I'll call the analytical performance strategy. So the analytical performance strategy is the following. The analytical performance strategy says, if I have sufficient analytical performance in the assay that I pick that outstrips vastly the clinical need for precision, then I have the option of expanding the, the size of the window for my quality control beyond what I would get in assay validation, three standard deviations, for example. The question is, how precise do I really need to be for this assay? If I can measure, let's say, glucose to 0 0.0001, and in fact nobody cares at that level of precision, um, then why, is, why would I need to control for that in quality control? Naively, what we often do is to follow CLSI checklists and ask and the question, what did I see in my, uh, as precision when I actually did my assay validation? But in fact, that may, again, be vastly more precise than we, in fact, need based on uh, our clinical uh, requirements. So if, in fact, you can say this is, uh, we don't have to be uh, particularly precise, and it's not an all or none phenomenon, um, and you have a reasonable measurement precision, and things could be a little bit bad from an analytical chemistry perspective before they would actually affect clinical um, care, then in fact there is a solution. And the solution is just to, uh, again, widen the window of quality control. So here we again have our 100 analyte um, assay. Here we have the 1-3-S rule. Um, this is basically just the same graph that I showed you before. If we go to a, a 4-S rule, we see that the, sh the curve comes here. If we go to a 5 um, S rule, the curve comes down here, and you notice that for, for both 4 and 5 S rules, we really have driven that false rejection rate down to essentially nothing. So if, in fact, we don't need that level of precision, we're fine. We can basically say, um, if, it's, if it's fine, for example, for uh, the assay to shift by nine standard deviations without affecting uh, clinical care, then we can say we're very likely to uh, detect that even if we just use a single 5S rule. 
but without the added problem of uh, false rejection. So if we have the analytical performance, that's great. We're done. Life is wonderful. We just have to pay attention to what our, our, our clinical uh, criteria are. Secondly, we could take a limited plex strategy. And the limited plex strategy is basically saying, you know, you talk about all this multiplex stuff, and that's all very interesting in a research context, but really what I want to do is to boil this down to the minimum number of analytes. And I'm going to hypothesize that the minimum number of analytes in this particular case is small enough that I'll be able to do traditional quality control, and I'll be able to model through. I won't have such a high plex of my multiplex that I will have this problem with false rejection. And in fact, if you have, um, if, if you can do that, it's great. We clearly see that by when you go from 100 analytes down to one analyte, you drive this false rejection rate down to essentially nothing. And if you can get down far enough on this y-axis, then things may be good. That's great, but a priori we don't know for any given disease entity when that, whether that's going to be the case until we do the work. And there's actually question about whether that would be, and which I'll show you in a minute, a question about whether that would be the right strategy in any case. So there may be a subset of assays for which driving it down to a small number of components is fine. Goodness knows we look at multi-analyte um, multi assays all the time, prenatal screening being a, sort of a classic example. And in those cases, of course, we're running them as single-plex assays, so that makes life substantially easier. But it's clear that if we get a small enough number of analytes, uh, this is a manageable uh, situation. But what if neither of those situations is actually the case? What if, in fact, we don't have sufficient analytical performance and we can't reduce to a very small number of analytes? Then we have to ask ourselves two questions. The first question is, is this assay a pattern or is this assay a panel? By pattern, I mean we have many analytes, but we essentially have one or a very small number of diagnoses that are coming out the bottom. So, is this tumor likely to metastasize, yes or no? Do I have disease X, yes or no, or disease A, B, or C? A very small number of uh, readouts at the end, not um, a situation where we're actually interested in reporting each analyte individually in the LIS. Conversely, we could be talking about many assays, a panel, which would really be equivalent to the high-throughput version of current assay. So in that case, we were saying we know that we have these omics technologies. We know that we can measure a lot of things very inexpensively and very quickly. Let's get all the information at once and be done with it. But we want to report each one out individually. And I want to know exactly what the level of gene X is. In that case, we're talking about something that's a panel. So the first question is going to be pattern versus panel. The second question has to do with the nature of the assay. And the nature of the assay question is, is this assay likely to ca fail catastrophically, or is it susceptible to analyte by analyte performance variation? So what do I mean by, is it likely to fail catastrophically? There are classes of assays where we can be relatively sure that either the whole thing has worked or the whole thing has failed. I think potentially you could put, with many caveats, you could potentially put DNA microarrays into this category. You might say, I don't think that there's going to be analyte to analyte variability in nucleic acid binding kinetics. I think that that's going to behave pretty well. In fact, if I put a couple sentinel controls on my chip or whatever methodology you're using, if I do a couple things like that, then I'm going to ensure that the whole system has worked and I'm not worried about each individual analyte. I'm not worried about one failing while five succeed. If that's the case, then life is, again, fairly easy. Because essentially what you've done is to reduce the number of controls. And by reducing the number of controls, reduce the effective plex of the assay with respect to quality control. So now you don't have that multiple hypothesis testing problem. You don't have that large um, uh, penalty that you're paying in terms of the false uh, rejection rate. On the other hand, if your assay is susceptible to analyte by analyte performance variation, then you have to ask the question, how do I control that in the same way that I control any other assay that is in the clinical lab? Now, you might, at this point, then think of this as a best case scenario versus a worst case scenario. In the best case scenario, all analytes behave identically. Any issue with one analyte affects all of them equally. This allows for the use of sentinel controls, as I've said. The worst case scenario is that, uh, that scenario on the bottom right that I just showed you. Um, analyte specific variation, need for individual controls for every analyte. So how do you handle that? Well, first of all, is that even reasonable? Am I creating problems where none exist? 
Well, if we think about things that may in fact make their way into the clinical lab, let's think about multiplex mass spectrometry. Let's think about this ESCAPA approach. This ESCAPA approach, which is originally developed by Lee Anderson, takes a, um, uh, and is obviously um, in wide use and by experts in this room, um, it takes a complex protein mixture, does a triptych digest, gets a complex peptide mixture, and then uses affinity reagents, antibodies on beads, whatever, in a competitive um, assay to uh, pull those down and do enrichment. And in that context, then, there's multiple reaction monitoring mass spectrometry that's used to do quantitation. This was a prototype for uh, possible mass spectrometry-based multiplex assay that was submitted to the FDA as part of a Mach 510K submission and has been reviewed. So it's clear that this is on the radar as a potential clinical assay. And the question is, could this worst case scenario apply to CIS-Kappa? And I would argue that it can. So that assay inherently involves trypsinization. And if you imagine a batch of trypsin slowly going bad, that batch of bad trypsin may differentially affect the ability to digest certain peptides versus uh, certain proteins into certain pep particular peptide fragments and not others. So you may, in fact, have a differential effect on different peptides that are in your final assay. And if the controls themselves need to be trypsinized, then you could have differential, then you have a problem potentially with differential stability of controls. This actually does have the problems of the worst case scenario, which is to say individual analytes need to be individually controlled. So once we've made that decision that we're in a, we're in a world where individual analytes need to be uh, individually controlled, we have to come back and revisit the issue of are we looking at a pattern or are we looking at a panel? So what do I mean again by patterns? I'm thinking about what the FDA called a few, several years ago IVD-MIAs, if you're familiar with that terminology. Many analytes, one diagnosis. So for example, a pattern of protein markers and you get high versus low risk uh, uh, cancer. I would propose that the solution to the quality control problem when you talk about panels has to do with, in, with the fact that there is built-in redundancy in multiplex assays as we can construct them. So what does robust quality entail? I would argue that there's an inverse relationship between redundancy and quality control stringency, which is to say the more redundancy you build into that assay, one might propose, and this is a hypothesis to be proven, and I'll try to convince you in the next few slides, but uh, the more redundancy you build into that assay, the more things can fail without the pattern as a whole failing which is to say you could get the same diagnostic answer even if, in fact, individual analytes had variability that was problematic. If that's the case, then actually more is better. And I think that this could potentially um, be tied to a paradigm shift in how we think about multiplexing. Because I think to date, by and large, we've tried to say, how can we simplify, simplify, simplify to measure fewer and fewer things? And in fact, if what I'm saying is correct, it may be that up to a certain point, we'd like to actually increase, increase, increase redundant markers. And certainly there are many um, uh, examples of this in the literature. And if economies of scale exist, then they can gu guide technology selection. If it's just as inexpensive to measure 1,000 things as it is to measure 20 things, then perhaps measuring 1,000 things is better. But if that's true, then there's a fundamental implication with respect to how we think about quality control in the first place. We think about components of test quality as involving test development and manufacturing and lab processing. And usually at this point, we pull out QC data. Something comes off the machine, and before we've done any real processing, we um, analyze those data for quality. And then we ask the question, should we go on and process them? But if what I'm saying is correct about the patterns, then I'll try to show you that QC is going to have to move down to the data analysis piece. We're fundamentally going to have to bring bioinformatics into pathology quality control for multiplex assays to the extent that those assays are patterns. So how do we do that? How can we, in fact, test the properties of the classifier and find out what analytes are likely to change a diagnosis as a result of a, uh, in a panel. One could imagine doing direct testing, which is to say making every conceivable change to a set of control materials and then to empirically test how, in fact, those perform on a given uh, analyzer. But there's no way that anyone's going to be able to do that. It could be the gold standard, but it would require such an extensive test set that it would be impractical to do so. A second option, though, would be to use simulation. That is to say, to look at the algorithm and directly perturb the algorithm and ask the question, which are the analytes that really affect the answer that I get at the end? Right? So we can explore the, the sensitivity of the assay to perturbation in a bioinformatic way. So here's an example. 
So many of you will be aware of the Mamreprint assay. The Mamreprint assay is, uh, has been commercialized by Agendi. It originally came out of work that was done at Merck and the NKI. And basically, this is a 70-gene classifier that predicts a woman's risk of having uh, distant metastases within five years as a result of a primary breast tumor. Um, if you look here at this column, this is metastasis. Black means no metastasis, and white mean, means metastasis. The genes are shown um, from left to right. A green means relative underexpression. Red means relative overexpression. Um, this was in the days before people realized that there were red-green colorblind people, and uh, so many, uh, many of these uh, diagrams were done in red and green, so I apologize if that's the case. You'll have to trust me, there's a big blob of red here and a big blob of green here. And from top to bottom, we have tumors. And what this assay basically did was to take a canonical good profile, that is to say, to take a set of, tum a set of tumors that had not metastasized within five years, and to ask the question, what's the average of all of the, uh, of the expressions of the genes, the 70 genes in that particular uh, set of tumors, and then to just do a correlation coefficient uh, between any given new patient and that canonical good prognosis profile. So we all know correlation coefficients, that we have a strong linear relationship that's positive, we end up with a correlation coefficient near one, if it's, uh, then if it's negative, if it's an anti-correlation, then it's near uh, negative one, and if the points are just scattered randomly, then it's near zero. And what you have here is a sorting of uh, the, the uh, tumors that they uh, looked at as a function of correlation coefficient. So here's one on the right, and here's negative one on the left, and what we have is a sorting from the, high, the, the, best, uh, progno the highest correlation with a good prognosis down to the lowest correlation with a good prognosis. And what you see with this, uh, as just by eye here with metastasis is that there's a predominance of non-metastasizing tumors up here in the good prognosis area, and there's a predominance of metastasizing tumors down here in the bad prognosis area, suggesting that we, in fact, have a reasonable classifier. And again, as you uh, probably know, the FDA has looked at this and has approved its use um, uh, as being offered in a reference lab uh, context. So the question is, how robust is this to perturbation? So how do we ask this question? Well, it turns out that we're in luck because the authors um, who uh, published the original Mamreprint study did a follow-up study that was in the New England Journal that had a new set of patients. So we can take that set of 234 patients, 141 poor prognosis patients, and 91 good prognosis patients. We can do exactly what the authors did, calculate the correlation with good prognosis. If that's less than their cutoff of 0.4, that's bad. You're in the bad prognosis category. If it's greater than 0.4, um, you're in the good prognosis category. So now what we can do is to pick a component repla and replace that component with a value from, random with, from a random sample. So we're, we're interested in the question, um, what do we do with values that are plausible but wrong? Figure that we can, by other quality control kinds of measures, pick out the crazy values. Let's look at the things that you actually realistically see in a patient, which nonetheless are pulled from a random patient. All right. Now we can ask the question, is there a change? And if what I've said is correct about the redundancy, the prediction would be that, in fact, you have some tolerance to that kind of random replacement before you find the assay breaking down. Now, at first glance, this next slide does not look like that. So this is the number of changes in diagnoses as a function of the percentage of perturbed components when we run this a bunch of times by simulation. And you can see that once you've uh, perturbed 20% of the components, you've changed over 10% of the diagnoses, which is not something that probably would be considered an acceptable performance. So we do need to pay attention to quality control here. So it looks initially like we don't get as much a bang, a bang for the buck as we'd expect out of the redundancy of the pattern. However, the reason that we, this is looking at changes in diagnosis, the reason that this curve looks this way is more evident when you actually look at the underlying distribution of the correlation coefficient scores that were used to make diagnosis. Because if you look at that underlying uh, histogram of correlation coefficient values, here's correlation coefficient on the x-axis is a histogram looking at frequency, and the red line shows the cutoff that was used diagnostically. What you see is that things are not as strongly bimodal as we might hope. You might hope that there's a great set of scores down here that are the poor prognosis people and a set of scores up here that are the good prognosis people, but in fact you have something that maybe indicates the overlap of two different distributions but is very difficult to tell. So maybe what's going on is that all these changes in diagnosis are things that are just bouncing back and forth across the threshold for diagnosis. And in fact, 
You can show that that's the case by looking at the change delta in, in the uh, correlation coefficient as a function of the number of components perturbed. And in fact, what you see now is that if you look at perturbing 10% of the components, that in the 95% confidence interval, the correlation coefficient does not change by more than 0.2. In fact, it changes by less than 0.2. So in fact, what I just showed you that initially makes it seem like, we have to, like we're going to have a real problem with quality control on the panel actually reflects the fact that there's a, a strong yes-no boundary here that's in the middle of a fat part of the curve. And in fact, if you create some sort of a gray zone in the middle, and I'm not sure if this tumor will metastasize, then the problems largely go away. In fact, what you can show is that if you look at that correlation coefficient of uh, a change of 0.2, you can actually take the majority of tumors, greater than 50% of the tumors, and still confidently assign them a classification of good prognosis or poor prognosis, even in a circumstance where you know that you've taken 10% of the components and drawn them and, and drawn another replacement value from a random patient. That is, it's a plausible yet completely wrong result for that particular patient, which says that you still do have some robustness in this, uh, even if you have a problem with 10% of the components. And in fact, you can go further than this by looking at component-specific perturbation and ask the question, are there particular components, using the same simulation method, that affect the diagnosis more than other components? Now, actually, if you look at the y-axis here in this delta correlation coefficient, we're looking at a y-axis value of 0 0.006. So the scale here is highly compressed. And the overall message is, well, really, no. There's no individual component that by itself makes a really huge difference. Right? We're getting a fairly even contribution from all components. And in fact, for most components, they're actually uh, not only small, but, but largely the same. So with the correlation coefficient in this particular assay, we see that we do not have overwhelming uh, sensitivity to a perturbation in only one component. Let me show you another example of the same kind of uh, perturbation analysis applied to some work we did recently with myelodysplastic syndrome. So, I've shown you a DNA microarray. Now let me show you a hematology analyzer, which we think of as more traditional kind of uh, uh, um, uh, item in the clinical lab. So now we're going to take a hematology analyzer and look at all the traditional analytes that, are, that it, or measurements that it can make, and then a bunch of the, the measurements that are made under the hood. So we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 50 uh, components now in a multi-analyte um, uh, assay. So we took. Uh, about 5,500 unselected outpatients for, for we, uh, which we had CBCs, identified patients who had myelodysplastic syndrome, excluded patients who were on chemotherapy where everything would be skewed in any case, um, and look, ended up with 59 patients with MDS, 4,980 control patients, and we divided those randomly into a training set and a test set. And then we built a classifier in the same way that the group, um, in, in the group uh, uh, with Agendia uh, developed a uh, correlation coefficient-based uh, uh, classifier. In this case, we used a so-called random forest algorithm, a random forest for um, those of you who are interested in the machine learning aspects, basically builds a bunch of decision trees based on subsets of the data. And then taking that forest of decision trees, it comes up with a composite um, classification or regression number. So we built a random forest, trained it on the training set, and looked at the test set. And what we found was actually very satisfying. We found that on the test set, we got quite good um, sensitivity and specificity. We had an AUC of 0.94 with respect to identification of MDS in an unselected group of patients. So one can imagine building this, for example, internally into a lab and using this as a method to decide which uh, slides would then be screened um, more closely by eye for um, potential myelodysplastic syndrome. So we looked at this, and in fact, I should say, although it's not something I'm going to talk about in more detail today, we went on to look at um, another uh, uh, group of patients that came from the Netherlands and in fact found that we were able to recapitulate this same result. We got very, uh, very high specificity in particular um, with this particular random forest classifier. So the question is, if we were to use this and if we were to quality control it, how robust is this particular assay? to perturbation. That is, how many things could be wrong and could actually fail um, and still give us the same answer? And the answer is, you can actually have a fair amount of failure before you have the assay itself fall apart. We now can see the uh, black line from the, uh, from the rock curve um, with the original prediction. Now if we perturb five components, 
um, then we get the with this red line. If we have t if we perturb con ten components, we get the green line, which is still more or less indistinguishable at the le level of granularity that we're looking at, given the number of uh, of positives that we have. Um, we, if we look at 20%, now things are starting to fall off a little bit by, th by not 20% rather, but 20 components. If we look at 30 components, things are really starting to fall off. And again, by the time we get to perturbing essentially every component, as we would expect, it's a coin toss. And we now no longer have diagnostic um, uh, sensitivity or uh, diagnostic specificity, uh, no longer uh, diagnostic performance. <coughs> so that says, though, that we could have a failure of five components. We could be loose enough on our quality control to even let five things fail, and we would essentially get the same performance of the, uh, of the classifier. And that's due to the fact that we have redundancy built into this panel. So if we build in redundancy, the quality control calculus changes. And now we can uh, essentially dial down the stringency compared with what we would get um, in a normal, uh, in a, having a normal uh, chemistry single plex kind of uh, situation. Now, you might look at this and say, well, that's kind of skewed because what you've done is to draw um, uh, values that are random values from your population. And you've got this huge number of negatives and this small population of positives. So when you redraw from the positives, you're going to, of course, likely pick a value that's negative. So you're going to lose some uh, uh, sensitivity there. But in fact, um, when you draw from a negative, it's overwhelmingly likely you're going to pick a value from another negative. And so if you then force the issue and say, well, despite the fact that we have um, you know, very disparate kinds of populations, um, we are going to force the worst case scenario, you get the following. So now if we say, well, instead of drawing randomly from the whole population, um, we're going to draw from whatever diagnosis wasn't the, the case for our initial um, uh, individual. So that is to say, if we have a negative individual, we force it to have a, a wrong positive value, value from a positive person and vice versa. And we get the following, uh, the following curves. And now after about five um, uh, components are changed, we do start to see some performance falling off. And of course, as you would imagine, once we're effectively at the end swapping uh, every single component, we can actually drive the AOC well below um, uh, fifth, uh, well below um, 0.5 and down, in fact, to zero because we're, we're forcing everything to be swapped. So this is an artificially bad situation, but makes the point that even in the worst possible case, excessively um, dire um, simulation, we can still uh, see that the, that the uh, overall diagnostic performance is reasonable even if you start to perturb a few components. Now, a couple slides ago when talking about the agenda data, um, I mentioned the fact that we can actually use this to look at which components are particularly susceptible to perturbation. Here's yet another example. Uh, this came from a work that uh, uh, was published by another group, not anything to do with our group, um, in 2002 looking at prostate cancer classification. And this was using uh, cell D mass spectrometry to do prostate cancer uh, uh, diagnosis. I'm not endorsing um, the diagnostic methodology. I'm just using this as an example of how you can perturb the bioinformatics to show you where you're vulnerable. In this case, we have a single decision tree. And so you go up here and make a decision about whether you have a particular um, uh, value and then go down the tree in the same way that you would any decision tree. And at the end, you're either um, prostate cancer, benign prostatic hypertrophy, or you're normal. So what happens if we do the change in diagnosis experiment? Well, as we saw before with the Agendia data, as you increase the number of per perturbed components, of course, the number of di change diagnoses uh, goes up. However, in this case, we get a different answer when we look at the, num at the percent change in diagnosis as a function of which peak is actually being perturbed. So now we're, gonna, we're going to ask the question, if I pick a peak, and perturb its value, that is draw a random value, how likely is it that the overall classification is going to be uh, changed as a function of which peak this is? And you see that you have some peaks here that are very um, important to the whole classifier, whereas you have other peaks that are very unimportant. And of course, when you think about it, that's probably not a surprise. Here we have peak number one. This is the one where if you uh, perturb it, 35% of the time you change the diagnosis. But the reason for that, of course, is that peak number one sends you down one whole side or the other of the classifier. If you are supposed to go down this side because you're normal, and in fact you go down this side, you can never get a diagnosis of normal. All the terminal nodes in this side of the tree are either prostate cancer or benign prostatic hypertrophy. So unsurprisingly, if you mess with that node, things are problematic. 
Conversely, if you mess with node number four, things don't change very much. You can go to benign prostatic hypertrophy here, but if you accidentally go down this side and change that yes to a no, you still have another analyte that can rescue you and tell you that you're benign prostatic hypertrophy as opposed to prostate cancer. So all of this says that, um, that the kind of bioinformatics actually matters, and the amount of redundancy actually matters. You would want to quality control analyte 1 at the level of stringency that you would any other analyte in the clinical lab. You might not care as much about quality control for analyte 4, and it may be that in a highly redundant pattern-based multiplex assay, in fact, this, uh, will, uh, this um, provides a way out of the quality control conundrum. Now, what I'm really saying, of course, you will realize is that you can have one test but many analyses. You can have one platform that's measuring a bunch of stuff, but by using different bioinformatics to do different kinds of diagnostic tasks, you will impose different constraints on the kinds of uh, quality control that need to be done. If you have uh, bioinformatics type 1, maybe there's one analyte that's incredibly important, like the top <laughs> node of the tree. If you do bioinformatics approach number 2, you may have a different set of analytes that are very important, and you will quality control that in a fundamentally different way. So thinking about bioinformatics will then become important. But this answers the question, do we accept uh, uh, all of the data, some of the data, or none of the data? Because the answer is it depends on what uh, informatics approach we're using. There may be situations where you have enough robustness built in, enough redundancy built in to your pattern-based analyzer where you can accept effectively all of the data, even if you have a few things that fail. It may be that you can accept some of the data because those data that you're accepting are the ones that you really care about and are the ones that are really the important drivers of the classifier and the others are mostly ancillary backup. Or it may be that the problem that you're having with QC is in that key analyte that everything else depends on, in which case you would accept none of the data. So for pattern-based assays, I'd argue that a pattern-based diagnostic paradigm may utilize redundancy to reduce individual analyte quality control stringency. Now, there's all sorts of implications that we could talk about for another hour just about f with this piece when you're talking about patterns. Because if you adopt this approach, it requires a change in, uh, to the way you do routine quality control, how you would do proficiency testing, EQA, all those sorts of things. However, I think that it's a potential way forward out of the quality control uh, conundrum for uh, pattern-based uh, quality, um, pattern-based um, classifiers. And one of the uh, things that this entails is that detailed analysis of the classification algorithm is critical for developing appropriate quality control. And I would argue that this means that as a field, lab medicine, um, we should be uh, advocating for transparency in algorithmic um, implementation. Because if algorithms become black boxes, then we will have no way of reaching inside as laboratorians and knowing, by perturbing in the way I've shown, which analytes are going to be critical, which ones we need to really pay attention to from a quality perspective, and which ones are potentially more ancillary, where you can dial back the quality control stringency slightly. So that's patterns. But then what about panels? Because I've shown you something that occurs when you have um, one assay, many analytes, but only a single or very few answers. What happens if you say, the reason I care about multiplexing is that I really want to report a hundred things in my LIS those that are all going to get pumped out to the electronic medical record as individually uh, validated analytes. So remember the problem we had. We have um, a, a, a 3S rule here. Um, here's how it looks uh, when you look at precision. And uh, we have a very, with the single plex assay, we have a very low false rejection rate. When we move up the number of things that we do, even if we uh, say that we're going to do, that something has to pass, if something has to pass a 2S rule, for example, we can shift the curve over here and become more sensitive, but with a two standard deviation rule, single two standard deviation rule, we end up with an increased false rejection rate. And of course, if we say, well, you have to pass, uh, you, you, you get two shots at your two standard deviation rule, we start to, we get a curve that's the green curve in the middle. Well, what happens if we use all of the West Guard rules? Because of course, that's why the West Guard rules were developed. You look at all the West Guard rules, you get a curve that looks like this. You actually get a curve that has the sensitivity of a 2S rule by itself, but has a fairly low false rejection rate here in the blue. 
So you can see why it is that Westgard rules are so popular. They're actually pretty sensitive for single-plex assays, and they have a relatively low um, re uh, false rejection rate. However, what happens if we do multiplexing? Well, if we do multiplexing of 3S, I've shown you, uh, here's a single-plex, here's a 100-plex, here's a 1,000-plex. By the time you're at a 1,000-plex, you're falsely rejecting everything. All right? Do Westgard rules rescue us? What happens if we apply the Westgard rules in a multiplex setting? Well, they also fail pretty miserably. By the, if you start here, we have that curve I just showed you uh, two slides ago um, that is looking at um, a single plex assay. We have the curve here in the middle that's red, which is a 100 plex assay. And we have the curve in the green that's a 1,000 plex assay. Basically, that curve never passes. Nothing can change, but you can never satisfy the Westgard rules for 1,000 analytes at a time. So you might say, well, what's going to work in this case? Well, I can tell you what else doesn't work. What else doesn't work is, for example, requiring the assay to pass at least once for a set of control measurements, requiring each analyte to pass at least once with multiple control measurements, requiring each analyte to pass multiple times for multiple control measurements. So you can imagine all sorts of different permutations, ways that you try to cut this to try and get at the information you really want. Most of these do not work. What does work? Well, it turns out there's something that's relatively simple that does work. And I think the reason that it's never been used is because of the fact that Westgard rules, for example, and really laboratory quality control in general, were developed coming out of sort of heuristic quality control metrics that were big in the 50s and 60s. So in the 70s, lab medicine gets on board, and we say, what do we need to do? We need Levy Jennings plots. We need to do that kind of quality control, and it will work pretty well. And why did it work pretty well? It worked pretty well because if you're in a lab and you, all you have is graph paper and a pen or a pencil and a ruler, you can plot out your daily quality control points and you can look at your 2SD or your 3SD uh, line and you can apply those Westgard rules. You can say, oh, look, there's something that beat the 3S rule. Here's 10 things on the same side of a mean. It was easy to tell and easy to apply the Westgard rules if all you had was uh, non-computational uh, tools at your disposal. But that's not the case anymore. We're now some decades past that and we have plenty of computational power and we can do statistics and replicate controls. So, what happens if we now start to uh, do uh, replicate controls? This is looking at a 2S, uh, 2, uh, 2S um, rule, a 3 2S rule, a 5 2S rule, rule. And in fact, that does reasonably well, but uh, what you lose is statistical power um, in terms of your ability to actually detect uh, true changes. What does work? Multiple control replicates with simple statistics. Right? So if, in fact, instead of saying, I'm going to run my control, my high and my low today, if you say, I'm going to run 10 controls in a row for a multiplex, and I'm going to do something simple like a t-test on every single analyte, it turns out that if you do multiple hypothesis testing, if you do Bonferroni correction on those t-tests, with, with 10 control values, you can actually generate enough statistical power to see what you need to see if you're starting to look at, for example, 100-plex assays. So how does this actually look? Um, and of course, we have t-statistics for looking at accuracy. We have f-tests to look at changes in precision. So here we go. Uh, we now have the single-plex Westgard rules shown here in the dark uh, line. And we have, in the red, a t-test where I am imagining that I had 100 replicates of my control when I validated my assay. And then every time I want to run controls, I'm going to run 10 versions of that control, 10 replicates, do Bonferroni, p of 0.01. I get a curve that's the red curve. That is to say, I get a curve that almost exactly mimics the power to detect true changes that you get from a single, in a single, single plex format from Westgard rules. But now I'm able to apply it in a, um, in a hundred plex um, context. Now, of course, the t-test doesn't do anything for you in terms of precision. But if you add an f-test, you see now the f-test in green doesn't do anything for you in terms of um, in, in terms of uh, accuracy, but it does quite a bit for you. It actually does better in terms of precision. And if you put those together and say, we have to pass the t-test and the f-test, you get the following uh, uh, line, this blue line. Now, that blue line still has a small false rejection rate. But what this is allowing you to do by running multiple uh, control replicates, 
is it allows you to overcome the multiple hypothesis testing problem that you generated as a result of doing a multiplexed assay. And that actually allows you to use a multiplex in a format that would, in fact, um, be, have individually reportable items. Now, is it worth, of course, the natural question is, is it worth doing that in a clinical lab? Am I really going to run 10 replicates of everything? And the answer is, it all depends. Whether you're willing to do that depends on the clinical situation and on the technology. If you were running DNA microarrays five years ago and you were spending you know, hundreds of dollars per microarray, there is no way you're going to run 10 microarrays, particularly if you have the rare patient who comes in with the disease that you need to test, so your batch size is very small. Right? So you're not go if, if the number of controls vastly outstrips the number of clinical samples, probably a bad idea. But if you're talking about a Luminex assay, and it's really cheap to run, and it's easy to run, and it's not too it doesn't take too long to run, then in fact it may be very reasonable to run multiple control replicates in exactly this way. And to use the statistical, just simple statistical tests co corrected for multiple hypothesis testing in order to do quality control. And in that way to uh, uh, show that you have equivalent quality control to what you can get in a single plex assay uh, format with traditional Westcard rules. You can start to do back of the envelope calculations as to what this would take to, be, to expand if you just have two equal groups um, and uh, make some assumptions about Bonfrani correction and what you need to get that kind of uh, performance. For single plex, the number is uh, you know, 9 or 10. Obviously, you're not going to do that. You just use standard quality control. For, uh, for a 10 plex, it ends up being 13, 14. For 100 plex, 17. For 1,000 plex, 21. And you can see this doesn't scale linearly. If you start to think about that hypothetical whole, whole proteome assay that I talked about at the beginning, the one where you could run it, you know, many times per second um, for the entire lifetime of the universe and still never be in control. In fact, if you were to run 27 controls, hypothetically, you could keep all of those, um, all of those, uh, uh, you could ensure that you had adequate uh, quality control on all of those analytes. So despite the initial difficulties, despite the fact that performance on multiplexing looks like it's a really dismal and difficult problem, um, I would argue that we can, in fact, develop feasible quality control schemes for highly multiplex assays. But there is a cost. For analytical performance strategy, it's dependent on the nature of the clinical problem. What is our clinical need versus our ability to measure um, from an analytical chemistry perspective? For a limited plex strategy, there's a constraint on assay design. For patterns, you need to analyze the behavior of the classification algorithm. And for panels, you need additional control runs and statistical quality control, but um, you will uh, fortunately get rid of Levy Jennings plots once and for all. And the number of analytes, I guess I just have said, for which this is worthwhile really depends on the batch size. So fundamental considerations of assay design, I think, allows us to overcome the worst case scenario for both patterns and panels. The reason I think that this is an important conversation to have for lab medicine right now is that we sort of stand at this uh, interesting juncture as these things start to come into the lab. On the one hand, there's the point of view that says um, that highly multiplexed assays will never make it in the clinical lab because you can't do traditional quality control. And what I hope I've convinced you, and actually what got me thinking about this just parenthetically years ago, was a conversation with a uh, senior colleague who said, I just came back from the NHLBI and told them that there's no way they would ever use DNA microarrays in the clinical lab. And I said, why not? You know, these things look like they're great. And it was essentially this, uh, this, um, th th this uh, problem of quality control. So I'm, I'm trying to show, I think, that there are, in fact, solutions to that problem. Um, but we could also go the other direction, and we could make the opposite of a uh, mistake of ignoring the problem. And I worry that there are certain um, assays where we're going to get sort of run over. The FDA will approve them in some form. We, there'll be a black box. It may be highly multiplexed. We'll say, well, you know, you can't do everything. It's a hard problem. We can't do quality control the way we used to. And that will work until there's a major problem and someone comes back to us and says, how could you possibly have let this happen? So I would argue that it's important for us to think as laboratory, clinical laboratorians about this um, at this particular point in history because um, it would uh, to simply go along and pretend as if the problem doesn't exist would also put us in a bad situation. But I'd be happy to answer any questions about any of this. And thanks very much for having me. I think we have time for a couple questions. If you could please repeat the question. Okay. Anyone in the audience? Um, yeah, Colin. Great, great talk. I mean, we, we, we think about, we've been, we've been struggling with all these issues, and this is <coughs> really fantastic. So, so um, 
my, my comment or my question is, so it sounds like for both the, the panel-based and the pattern-based multiplex assays you're referring to, you're talking in both cases about uh, multiplex quantitative measurement. Yes, that's right. That's so, right. so do you have any comments? So what, what we're doing, at least in my, in my area of genetics, is, is, is large panel multiplex, panel-based, but, but right. qualitative. And do you have any comments on, on that aspect of, of QC for multiplex qualitative analytics? Yeah, and so that, you know, it's an interesting. So the question to repeat it was, what about um, what about qualitative assays? Um, these are I've shown you multiplex quantitative assays, but do things change if you're talking about uh, you know, SNP positive or negative or whatever the example would be? Um, the answer is, I think it depends in large measure on how good that call is, how much separation there is on that call. You know, we have this problem now in a clinical lab where we have things that are semi-quantitative and they're cut, you know, signal to, you know, signal to, um, uh, the signal cutoffs, for example, for vir uh, viral serologies, um, where, you know, there is in fact a decision boundary and how good, how well that test performs. Uh, really depends on how many samples you get sort of near that decision boundary. And I think that in those cases, it really does um, serve one well to think about what the uh, quantitative behavior is at that middle point. But if you say, look, I get a presence or absence call, and it's very clear, and I never, you know, if I draw my histogram, there's nothing in the middle. Um, and really, therefore, I'm concerned about failures that would have that kind of non-quantitative effect for other reasons. Then I would say that probably other quality control strategies would be more, uh, more appropriate. It may, in fact, be that you fall into that category of things where you're not seeing a lot of um, uh, analyte to analyte variability. You know, if you can find one locus, you can find them all. Um, and if that's the case, um, as I said for that second category, um, I think that life is, life is a lot easier. You can throw some sentinel, uh, sentinel controls on and say, I'm done. But I think that it's a, it's a really important question for us as a community to ask in any individual case. I'll just, just ask yeah. one other quick one. Um, you talked about the canonical way of doing QC with the QC batch comes and then the patient comes. In chemistry, what we like to move towards is actually, and some people already do, is patient means. So mm -hmm. you actually do your quality control on the actual patients. Is there a way to apply patient means to this? Like maybe by patient looking at principal components in the patient uh, results to sort of look for, are the patients themselves in control rather than relying on external quality? Right. So, so yes. So patient means are interesting because they, uh, the question was about can you use patient means and how does that behave. Um, there, I think patient means are interesting because in effect what you're doing is kind of a rolling average of what I described at the end where you're basically taking larger statistical chunks and, and looking at them. The, the issue there is how, how long can you be out before you recognize it. And um, uh, that, that would be my concern. You're right that multiplexing, those means will still vary, and I would have to sit down and think about, you know, I, I, I don't know if anyone else has done it. I have not quantitatively modeled um, what the excursion of those means might be in a multiplex setting, because again, you might get, you might have exactly the same problem where if you look at enough means, something's going to look like it's out, even though it's, it would eventually drift back down, um, depending on what the variance is of that mean measurement. But, um, but I think that you, if, you know, if you were able to chunk it in a way that got the sweet spot between picking up a change early enough, but not, um, not looking at the, um, lo looking at parts of the bell curve that are going to um, affect uh, multiplexing, then that might be useful. All right. Thanks very much.